Jema. So we meet again, uh, and today the passage that uh, Satish has selected is the ideal of the Karmi Yogin. It's a beautiful passage, and in a way, it maps out the future of uh, India, the road which we should take uh, to once again see India rise to the greatness. Uh, but before that, just a little background, because uh, during the freedom struggles, Shirobindo edited three magazines and he wrote for one another. And their names are very interesting and significant. They form, as it were, the backbone of what India should be in the future. So first, as we know, is Bande Matram, meaning thereby India is not a piece of land. It is not just a country. It is a mother. It's, it's a living entity. So through Bande Matram, he was awakening India, Indians to the idea that it is not a piece of land that you are fighting for or worshipping. Obviously, that would be meaningless to fight for a land. So she is a goddess, she is a living reality. So this is the first magazine. Second one which he edited was Dharma. Dharma was in Bengali. So this is the basis of life, the basis of creation. The divine also creates, keeping dharma in mind. So many times when we say, he should do this, he should act arbitrarily, he will not do it. Not because he cannot do it, but you can't act and do something which is not in tune with dharma. It, it is, there is a reason why things happen the way they happen. So he will crush the forces of a dharma, but when we ask divine for things, we should remember that he acts according to dharma and this dharma is about the law of evolution in built in creation the law of truth which is in built in creation and that is why how much ever one may go stray or even an excess of evil ultimately it collapses and that i have given several examples that forget about ramayana and mahabharata even in our own time we have seen the british empire collapse we have seen the hitler stalin mussolini how they have collapsed and we are seeing now the um, arrogant uh, countries, how they are collapsing, because this is the inbuilt in creation. So, Satyamev Jayate, so that's the dharma part of it. And the third magazine which he edited, uh, from where we have this writing, is Karmi Yogin. So, why Karmi Yogin? And it used to ca carry a picture of Sri Krishna and Arjun on the chariot. So, just like Sri Krishna, we see Sri Aurobindo setting us on the path of action. So this is important because see Gita has been translated by so many people in so many ways and uh, I remember one uh, when one commentator, one uh, journalist asked Gandhiji that you speak about Gita as being the uh, inspiring guide to you but the Gita speaks about violence, it speaks about action, it speaks about engaging in a most violent form of action. So how do you reconcile it? And he said it's all symbolic. He brushed it away, saying Mahabharata is a, uh, it's all symbolic. The Pandavas are the goodness in you, the Kauravas are the evil in you. This is sheer nonsense. It, I mean, a hundred evil, five good, and people even try to explain all this. It has its meaning, but it is a real battle against real forces. And these forces have entangled the creation in a mesh. So, uh, we have to understand that these forces are not just inner and symbolic, they are real in real world, they take human forms, they push human beings and thereby they govern and control earth's destiny and India's destiny. And if we don't understand it, we will completely falsify our position. That Krishna is also nothing but within us, he is the avatar, standing at the doorway of a transition of, of one age to another. So, Shurabindo, once again, brings back that great truth. Why Karmi Yoga? Why not Gyan Yoga? Why not Patanjali Yoga Sutra? Why not Bhakti Yoga, etc.? Because Karmi Yoga is the royal road which is given to man, not only by the Gita, but Isha Upanishad. Kurvanne vehe karmani jije vishashatang sama. We had built Indian civilization on the basis of Karmi Yoga. And it was lost over a period of time. And then Sri Krishna brings it again. Again it was lost in all lot of sadhu, sant, sannyasis. Again Sri, Krishna, uh, Sri Aurobindo brings it again to the forefront. So uh, what is the difference? Well, Gyan Yogi and Bhakti Yogi, those pursuing through Bhakti, those Sankhya, people who follow Sankhya and many other paths, they have a tendency to withdraw from the world because the Gyan Yogi is looking for a Jnana which is transcendent, far beyond. The Bhakti... Um, 
panth they are looking for the divine beloved once they find they are happy adoring the divine but karma yogi has to find the divine through works and he has to fulfill the divine in life through works so he cannot escape from the path of works and that's why the beauty of this path and and pro propounding this ideal for humanity for earth for very much for india and that is the path of karma yoga and shubindu speaks again and again about it at one place he says vivekananda exalting sanyas uh, he said that you know there is one janak but so many sanyasis but uh, shubindu says janak is not one person janak is a lineage of kings and they ruled according to the great truths of karma yoga she rama is a karma yogi if you really look at it and most importantly in karma love and knowledge invariably meet you cannot have karma without knowledge as its background and karma cannot be really arrive at its fulfillment full dynam dynamism unless there is love for what you are doing love for the divine in the background so karma yoga is a combination of all the three yoga and that's how he gave the ideal of karma yogin for particularly for india it's applicable for the whole world but then we do not proselytize let the world go according to wherever they want to go for us the ideal of the karma yogin so he speaks of it with regard to india and indians the task we set before ourselves not meca is not mechanical but moral and spiritual by mechanical it meant is change of rules regulations and uh, you see it is so important we aim not at the alteration of a form of government but at the building up of, of a nation so we always feel that if governments change then they will be suddenly a change well to an extent government can help or hinder but they are the same human stuff if human beings don't change nothing will change and to change we have to engage in yoga so we have to build a nation by a change of consciousness of the average indian at least even if we have few indians who can uh, be as living yogins and that's how shirbindo brings toward the end of this article of that task politics is a part but only a part so politics has its place but when we believe that all and grossing idea that change of politics and government will change people it is the other way around when people change the politics changes that's how we see how did our government change because people felt an angst and they responded in a certain way and that we see all over the world people respond they are not completely unconscious so as people change their demands from the government change and government is compelled to change so this is how we have to understand that things work the other way around people must change the nation must rise up and have the right demands before itself before each one of us so he is saying the task we set before ourselves so politics is a part but not the only thing we shall devote ourselves not to politics alone nor to social questions alone social questions are like reforms people talk about uh, like uh, burqa pratha okay so this is uh, important you know so or different pratha social intercaste marriages uh, we have replaced for example class with caste india had class not caste but we have replaced all these so they these are important questions social reforms dowry system so these are reforms but that is not enough nor to theology or philosophy or literature or science by themselves we spend lot of time in discussing about i have seen you know uh, people discussing vedanta and after that they are just waiting that okay one hour podcast is over now we can have our cup of tea like a release phenomena they lead a normal life ordinary life that's not enough philosopher is living in some part of the higher mind or he visits it occasionally he is striving to visit it but then life doesn't change and we look at even great philosophers many of them they live in that atmosphere time to time some like gate they withdraw in that region we have uh, in germany for example you have uh, a whole when you walk around the mall you have another tire which is philosophers walk so there you have a different feeling because you are a little above 
and from there you can see the sky and this thing in a different way. So philosophers walk in a little above in the mind, but sometimes they become totally oblivious of their bodily life, of their uh, other aspects of life. So that's not enough. So uh, neither to these things or literature or science by themselves, but we include all these in one entity which we believe to be all important. What is that entity? The Dharma, the national religion which we also believe to be universal. And I have, uh, will float a suggestion today. Uh, I don't know where and where it will catch. We have been making constitution as dharma. Constitution is not dharma. We should not be defensive about it. Constitution is a typically British or, or the Western worldview. And that worldview is based on reason. It has its meaning, I am not saying. But instead of Bharatiya, whatever it is called as, uh, we should have the Bharatiya Dharma Sahita. And Bharatiya Dharma Sahita means what our constitution should be. For instance, do we accept freedom of speech uh, abusiveness? Well, people can abuse. But abusiveness is suicide. It creates so many negative vibrations in the whole atmosphere. Should we include that? as part of freedom of speech or we should not. I am just giving one thought. So there are many things which are, for instance, when somebody is married, does the husband have a right over the wife in even physical relations that she should be compelled to have physical relations even without her choice, without her wanting it? Is it dharma? Is it a dharma? When there is a person who is, and of course vice versa, uh, in, and if there is, for instance, uh, a person who is on the verge of in coma for a long time, should one have the right to cut off the cord? Is it dharma or a dharma? We have to discuss on that basis and not on the basis of percentages and, you know, secular ideas and religious ideas or scriptural ideas. And there is so much within us, we have completely abandoned it. So the basis of the nation should be dharma. And mother spoke about it passingly. She said India is the only place where the psychic law can and must prevail. So psychic law brings the sense of beauty, sense of good, sense of truth. So all these things. The national religion which we also believe to be universal. <clears throat> and what this religion is, what this dharma is, Sri is describing for us. There is a mighty law of life. A great principle of human evolution, a body of spiritual knowledge and experience of which India has always been destined to be guardian, exemplar and missionary. So the entire Indian polity, if we go back to those times when it rose to greatness, was centered around dharma. We see debates taking place. Is it dharma? Is it a dharma? Kings are involved in that assembly. And then there is a discussion on what really it should be. And that's how it should come back. The only division should be dharma and adharma, not, not no other division. Society should not be divided along other lines. If a Muslim does a dharma, it is a dharma. There is no question of it. If a Hindu does a dharma, it is a dharma. You can't simply uh, say one section has a right to do certain things. And other section not. Why? Because we have to use percentages and secular and all these ideas. So this is how Indian polity always has been. This is the Sanatan Dharma, the eternal religion. So eternal religion, why? Because this is inbuilt in creation. For instance, it is the Dharma of the tiger. Tiger does not deviate from its Dharma. You try making me a vegetarian, <laughs> you run the risk. The serpent has its own dharma. It is fearful and it hides in a hole. It is shy. But if you step, it will bite. It will not think that you know you probably will die. It will be a tragedy in your life. So, human beings also have a dharma. At different ages, there is a dharma. For instance, the dharma of the student is to grow and progress. So, if you tell them, okay, you can take, um, you can watch a horror movie, it's all cool. Parents sitting with uh, children and saying, okay, let's have a drink together. This is not dharma, simply because it's not about being right or wrong. But this is an age when you are most, uh, you know, receptive and responsive to growth, progress and learning. 
So the dharma of this age was what was called as Brahmacharya Ashram. Brahmacharya is not just about sexual continence, but one pointed discipline towards progress. And if one can bring that. Similarly, there was a Grahastha Dharma, which included so many beautiful things. And so there is a dharma. I am not saying we should ad adopt that formula or same thing. But we have to understand that this dharma is a very beautiful, inbuilt, evolutionary mechanism. And it is not uniform. But something which takes into account the stage of human being, the evolutionary process. For example, the rule or the punishment, if you want to put it, for a king or a, or a minister doing the same mistake should be many times more than a commoner. That's how it was. If a king made a mistake, it was far more serious. If a priest made a mistake, why? Because he is supposed to be the custodian of dharma. If he makes an error, there is, you know, it, it affects the whole society. So, you know, when you see dharma, dharma is not flattening of things. It is something which takes into account the inherent plasticity in human beings. That's why it's an evolutionary law. For the religion, under the stress of alien impact, she has largely lost hold, not of the structure of the dharma, but of its living reality. Structure of the dharma is elders must be respected. Living reality is where Nachiketa tells his father, Vajeshravas, Dad, you are wrong. Prela tells his dad that, Dad, you are totally mistaken. You are delusional <laughs> when you say you are God. That's dharma. When Draupadi, literally in the whole Sabha condemns, when Draupadi, like a fire, wakes up beam and says, what kind of a husband you are, that you are sleeping peacefully, when there is this fellow Kichak, he is <laughs> trying to threaten me. So, dharma is what we should come back. We have the, uh, structure is there, outer structure. But the spirit from that structure is completely gone. So we follow it mechanically. For the religion of India is nothing if it is not lived. And to live we have to understand the spirit. Living is not mechanical machine like living. Touching the feet of parent because they are elders is mechanical. Respect which should come from within. Which means parent should also be worthy of that. So that famous saying, Acharya Deva Bhava, Pitra Deva Bhava, Matra Deva Bhava is not just that they, you should treat them like Deva. It means that Acharya better be like a God. <laughs> Father better be like a God. Patient like a God. Mighty an example like a God. And mother be like a God. So um, it has to be lived. It has to be applied not only to life but to the whole of life. Not just when we are doing some puja agarvati. Not just when we are celebrating Diwali and Holi and some festivals. But whole of life. Everything should be... Dharma means whatever we deal with, we must understand its law of life. If we were to uh, you know, lead today in India, life based on dharma, uh, all this thing about you know, meat, industries done in a very cruel manner, all this will automatically stop. It's not that you cannot eat meat, you, you can eat meat. But the way it is done, that basic respect which you should give to an animal life, not just like a glutton, you are doing it. All this should be inbuilt as part of dharma. So, consumerism, utilitarianism, all this will go away because that is not dharma. Automatically, you don't have to worry about socialism or because you cannot do social. If you are really following dharma, you cannot just say, Ki, I am going to uh, just grab all the money for myself and not care about those who are, uh, you know, um, for whom I am responsible in some way or the other. You cannot do it because it's adharma. So we don't need to import those schemes from outside. We are our own sense of dharma. Its spirit has to enter into and mould our society. Our politics, our literature, our science, our individual character, affections and aspirations. Everything. So what was that character which said that if I promised once, I promised there was no patta, no uh, legal document, all this was not there. Why? Because men were like that. They lived in a society where to, one had to honour promise as something sacred. And if one didn't, and that's what the, the custodian of this was given to the higher moulds, the Brahmins and the Kshatriyas. And then the rest followed. So, when people saw that promise means something, 
then the society felt a pressure inbuilt to live according to this higher molds. To understand the heart of this dharma, to experience it as a truth, to feel the high emotion to which it rises. Just imagine, when Rama says it doesn't matter that my father has not asked me to go, I know that he is caught in a dilemma and therefore I must go because this is the great work of the Ikshvaku clan. It's known by this dharma. They are custodians of dharma. And I cannot do something which is not consistent with my own, our own highest ideals. So that's how he reminds us to live. We believe that it is to make the yoga the ideal of human life. Again, we don't know what is yoga till date. Majority we talk about yoga, we have yoga day. And it's such so, at times so sad. Uh, it's very good. We are happy that we have international yoga day. And then we celebrate only by doing these sirsasanas and various asana and make a whole show out of it, video projections. First lesson of yoga is that all is done by the divine. You don't project yourself. You do it and it's yoga is something inner. What is the yoga that Sri Krishna gave to Arjun? He didn't tell him that do matsyasana and shoot an arrow. You do sarvangasana and then next you shoot another arrow. Or do sirsasana. He is not telling him all this. He is not even teaching him breath control. Mind control he already has. What is that great yoga, karma yoga which Sri Krishna gave to Arjun? We should bring it out that this is yoga. Esha dharma sanatana. And in every yoga class, that's how we should present. And I am uh, sorry but being very frank. Even many times I have seen, even in Shurabindo's movements, we talk about yoga and yoga ends up with physical yoga. Of course, we put a uh, tadka of Shurabindo. Body more conscious. How do you make the body more conscious? Simply by words? To live a conscious life, what it means? So we should be very clear. Shurabindo is saying it very clearly. To feel the high emotions to which it rises. Body more conscious has no meaning if it is not to become an instrument at the service of the divine. Otherwise, we are creating a titan. Ravan perfected Hatha Yoga. He is the original Hatha Yogi, incidentally. Bali, the titan, he is the one who gave Raja Yoga. <laughs> so, you make a perfect body instrument, but you don't want to talk about the divine because it has to become instrument of the divine. It has to become instrument of the soul. So, that means finding the soul and the divine will go hand in hand. You cannot just have physical asanas and be, have a strong body and mind. This strong and body and mind at the service of the titanic ego is the most dangerous thing we can ever have. So, this about yoga. And execute to feel the high emotions. So, high emotions to which it rises. Body becoming an instrument of the divine. And to express and execute it in life is what we understand by karma yoga. We believe that it is to make the yoga the ideal of human life that India rises today. And if India cannot do it, it may have all the best industries, all the mechanized infantry and uh, absolutely perfect war machine. It will become another America. And we know which way that is going. So while all these things are fine, but yoga is the ideal of human life in every sphere. And this is something which has to emerge from within. You can't force yoga by saying, everybody come in time. Yes, okay, when society is very primitive, you need to do it. But there is such a massive work ahead. One of the things in ashram, you see, I give this example. Why in ashram? Most people, almost all I know of, they come in time for work. There is no imposition. Because now we know about digital. In UP, they started the digital thing. Uh, attendance and people are reacting to it. Why? Because they can't come late. In the ashram, there is no such outer compulsion. But people go in time, even when they know that there is no immediate work. And there is only one sentence of Sri saying, regularity and punctuality go a long way in, on in self-mastery. Many of us, we want to be there in time. We want to be there for the work. Even if there is no work, Apparently. That's why. Because you feel inspired. Because that's the culture that yoga builds. That self-discipline, self-mastery. If we can't even self-discipline, we can forget about self-mastery. And forget about world mastery. <laughs> so, 
So this self-discipline is the first step in yogic life, living. So that's how understand by Karma Yoga. We believe that it is to make the yoga the ideal of human life that India rises today. By the yoga, she will get the strength to realize her freedom, unity and greatness. By the yoga, she will keep the strength to preserve it. It is a spiritual revolution we foresee and the material is only its shadow and reflex. So this is the passage and it closes in the original writing with equally powerful passage. I'll just quickly read it just as a reminder. He's given a program. You cannot cherish these ideals. We say to the individual and especially to the young who are now arising to do India's work, the world's work, God's work. You cannot cherish these ideals. Still less you can fulfill. Can you fulfill them if you subject your mind to European ideas or look at life from the material standpoint? That's what European idea of life is all about. And all those ideas come and our schools pick it up and we feel cool doing it. And uh, while good things should be taken from every side. But what is our own ideal? We, don't, we have not even formulated a national policy of anything based on the Indian context. We of course have names. <laughs> national education here. So much work to be done. National Law Commission. But there is nothing national about it. It's all imported. Constitution is sacred. Our holy book. Parliament is our temple. This is not how we can really... Uh, you know, bring that yoga back. Materially, you are nothing. Recent visit to America and several times I have been there and people ask this time also that, what's your impression there? I said, it, the soul is getting stifled more and more. Superstructure of mechan you know, machinery. Giant superstructure. And machinery which is all, all around and of course now the AI has come people are very happy and discussing and debating about it but we don't realize that somewhere the human soul is getting stifled in it so if we take that only material progress is the criteria then that's the path we can go down materially you are nothing spiritually you are everything that's how we created a huge civilization that first the wealth of the spirit then the outer riches. If we have outer riches, don't have wealth of the spirit, we are Ravan. If we have inner riches, even if we lose the outer, we still can get it back. That is Rama. This is our ideal. That's how we have been. Shiva we worship, who is void of anything, yet he can give anything to anyone. That's the ideal of the yogin. And of course Krishna we know, Raj Rajeshwar, attached to nothing. He can walk away in one moment, in the middle of that ras, and in one moment he can equally with his that equal heart, he can see the destruction of his own clan. Why? Because it has gone the wrong way. And we have people claiming to be Yadavas who are descendants of Krishna. And then they vote and and block because Yadavas must vote for Yadav. Krishna the Yadav allowed the destruction of his own Yadav clan because they have taken the path of Adharma. This is India, not this that today we speak about. It is only the Indian who can believe everything, dare everything, sacrifice everything. Sacrifice, the word has escaped us completely. First, therefore, become Indians. Recover the patrimony of your forefathers. Recover the Aryan thought, the Aryan discipline, the Aryan character, the Aryan life. And they want to blot out the word Aryan. It's the most, the word with the most noblest history. Shavinda says it's the one word which has the noblest history attached to it, the word Aryan. And people have addressed each other, Arya. It meant that, see, who you are, this action does not go with your Aryahood. That's what it meant, a psychological type. Recover the Aryan character, the Aryan life. Recover the Vedanta, the Gita, the Yoga. Recover them not only in intellect or sentiment, but in your lives. Live them and you will be great and strong, mighty, invincible and fearless. Neither life nor death will have any terrors for you. 
difficulty and impossibility will vanish from your vocabularies for it is in the spirit that strength is eternal and you must win back the kingdom of yourselves the inner swaraj before you can win back your outer empire there the mother dwells and she waits for worship that she may give strength believe in her serve her lose your wills in hers your egoism in the greater ego of the country your separate selfishness in the service of humanity recover the source of all strength in yourselves and all else will be added to you social soundness intellectual preeminence political freedom the mastery of human thought the hegemony of the world this is the ideal the ideal of the karma yogi and when we live life like that wherever we go we are like a lamp that radiates light and um, somehow we go very uh, you know like we still were following few decades back that unless you are in tie unless you are in suited boot you know you won't get respect what nonsense <laughs> unless you speak good english where are your thoughts so we have to lead that life where each one of us is full of the spirit the breath of the spirit in thoughts feelings will action and then we will recover all that india once had and not just by discussing it on whatsapp that we had once pushpa kiwan we had this we had that yeah we had that but we lost it because we stopped living it okay so i'll i'm not going more into it because uh, then it's a very powerful passage uh we can take up the questions few questions which uh, as i said we'll take up uh, the take it up uh, on i'll answer it because we had answered it but i'll write and answer it so that they'll go as written answers so we start now from here i'll pick up from somebody should have reminded me that i am supposed to pick up from otherwise i'll go wrong in sequence okay the sequence is just a moment yeah okay so the questions are one according to sri aurobindo who is the supreme does sri aurobindo refer to any specific form sagun of the supreme does he equate vasudeva or narayana whom he mentions often with the absolute paratpar brahman so uh, of course these are all terms which have now come into our but according to shurbindo and if you see it it refers to all our scriptures also so we use a word uh, a mantra om tat sat so first supreme is tat absolute tat you cannot define it's par brahman if you like if we define it as supreme existence if we define it as non existence if we define it as nirgun sagun formless with form anything it's not a, the tat tat is tat you cannot define it it is indefinable but we can of course experience there are several stages of that experience you can completely annul yourself in it you can it is not definable but something of it can be experienced in life so that is tat then the next absolute is sat sat is now the same tat assuming a existence infinite existence so that is ekameva dvitya the purusha the one purusha the satchidanand satchidanand brahm with whom we can connect so that's the second absolute not second in terms of hierarchy but they are all together but in this way so there is tat and sat so when it refers to us then it is sa purusha evascha so sa just as this is tat this is sa so sat the third absolute is aditi the divine mother so it's absolute because she is the supreme power that governs creation and the fourth absolute is parmeshwara of the gita and parmeshwari of the tantra so parmeshwara and parmeshwari so we have the gita speaks about purushottama that's where the purushottama comes in the so these are the four absolutes 
Each of them is an absolute. And this word absolute means two things. One is full. Purna. It needs nothing. And even if you subtract anything from it, it still remains full. So it is Purna. It's whole, complete. It doesn't need anything to complete it. The second sense of this word absolute, absolute is actually used for Brahman in Western metaphysical literature. So the second sense of absolute is the ultimate. There is nothing which is beyond it. So one sense is there is nothing beyond it. Second is full in itself, wholeness, completeness, perfection if you want to put it. So one sense of it is Tat, first absolute, Sat, second absolute, Divine Mother, Aditi, third absolute, Parmeshwara and Parmeshwari, fourth absolute. This is beyond manifestation. Then there are absolutes in manifestation. So there is the unmanifest. It's an absolute because it is from there that manifestation begins. So there is the unmanifest. Then you have the eternal manifestation, Satya Lok. So we talk about Brahma Lok, Satya Lok, Chidghan Lok. Tapo Lok, Anand Lok, they are absolutes in their own right in manifestation. It's ultimate in, in a certain sense. And then again you have the Divine Mother. Because Divine Mother is there as well as she works in creation. So these are the three absolutes in manifestation. The Divine Mother is common to both. She is beyond existence and non-existence. It, it, it's all, I mean, we are using differentiating in terms of our understanding. So where does Nirgun and Sagun come? Nirgun and Sagun comes when the same experience of Parmeshwara and Gita has made it very clear to us. So is experienced as the soul is approaching towards that supreme absolute. It experiences first that as Nirgun because all the human qualities definitions by which we try to understand it doesn't fit into it. It's freed from all that. On the other hand, if it approaches from another side, the ultimate of all the qualities, ultimate of love, ultimate of knowledge, ultimate of courage, ultimate of, ultimate of strength, ultimate of peace, it goes to Sagon Brahm. In, in Savitri, they are defined very beautifully. I mean, described very beautifully. So, if you approach from one side, taking qualities as manifestation of the divine, distorted in creation, you want to arrive at that absolute, you'll arrive at Sagun Brahm. And when you arrive through neti neti, not this, not this, so you will arrive at the nirgun aspect of Brahman. But the two are not two different, but two sides of one reality. So one has to transcend both to arrive at that supreme reality, which is at once anant gun as well as it holds the akshar Brahma within itself. That is the purushottama. So the Gita takes us to that fourth absolute, if you like. This is not there in traditional yogic literature. Your traditional yogic literature speaks of either the two levels. One is the sh in, in Shar, immutable becoming, and the other is immutable, the Brahman. So there the Sagun and Nirgun come. It doesn't take you to the absolute, the, what is beyond it. Uh, later yogas, yogis started mentioning about Parabrahman, which they used as a term which includes all of this together. <laughs> but basically indefinable, ineffable, indescribable, neti neti. But equally you can describe it as iti iti. So these are the absolutes which Sri speaks about. And we can use the words. Ha, namaste. Namaste. Could I ask a question spontaneously kind of interaction with you? Okay, but I have a list. So I was wondering if I should complete it or we can take one question like that. Yeah, please. Please go ahead. Karma Yoga is the central topic today related to this. Yes. Uh, uh, when we study essays on the Gita synthesis of Yoga, yes. very very clearly we come to know three dimensions of Karma Yoga as a path towards the union with the Supreme. Yes. No, number one is no hankering after the result or the fruit of our action. Yes, absolutely. Nishkam Karma. Next, again, share the Do and Gita, raise the level of the Karma Yoga that there should yes. not be any attachment to action. Yes. Or to inaction. Either ways. Uh, hmm. Either. Ah. And then the third one, that is the height of Karma Yoga, is 
never assume or claim any sense of doership yes yes absolutely these three uh, uh, things are discussed a lot mentally and intellectually ah huh. but uh, people fail to understand this clearly without the awakening of the soul conscious uh when the soul consciousness the psychic being is awakened uh, these three dimensions become very clear to us yes of course but even like uh, i i see that point but even if the buddhi can be really awakened i understand that they become absolutely clear when the psychic being is awakened then you know that all is the outflowing of the divine and claim to be the doer and claim to you know uh, attachment to anything because then you become an obedient servant of the divine will and the divine will may be just stay quiet the divine will may be act in a battle divine will may be the sword is broken and thrown aside but even short of that very logically i am saying this because uh, i remember uh, i have shared this experience during my mbbs days 16 17 uh, years of age this had become very clear to me that we are not doers leave aside attachment to because see whatever intelligence is there in me is not mine it is by nature nature is the doer and then by strictly logical analysis Uh, rational understanding i arrived at this idea uh, that well we claim the doership but actually nature is the doer so from that the next idea came that what is our role then then we have to i didn't have the idea of upgrading nature and its possibility that came later with the idea of yoga but the instrumental personality should be uh, the capacity of the instrument should be such that it is able to transmit or express this intelligence in a very beautiful way so the sense of doership even uh, the impulse to act arises sarv sankalp sanyasi we know that we say it is me and mine but it's not me and mine it arises action happens as the gita says develops within us so even logically we can understand it but the challenge is to live it because the ego keeps us drawing to the fruits ego doesn't let go easily that's where the psychic being and before the psychic being uh, the practice of equanimity equanimity is the practice with which the knot of the ego becomes weak if we of course we can go directly to discover the psychic being but time and again the ego pulls us back so if we just take as a practice that i am going to practice equanimity so whether it's pleasant unpleasant or painful whether i am working in this position or that position in high low or not working either which way i will remain in a state of equanimity whether somebody insults me or somebody praises me i'll practice equanimity that's how the gita puts it shitoshna sukh dukheshu hani labho jaya jayo whether my i put in all the effort and my work meet success or failure so again we practice equanimity so equanimity is the core practice and equanimity is is a practice actually a practice so if if this we and it has also three stages indifference endurance a uh, resignation of the saint a philosophical attitude so we can take any of these four attitudes and practice equanimity once we practice equanimity is a beautiful launching boat to dive into the soul so equanimity is the diving board from where we can just deepen it and we'll touch the soul but without practice of equanimity it's not easy it can be done but yes its fullness appears only when we have touched the psychic core that's true because then we know automatically that we are not the doer <laughs> the divine is the doer then we know automatically that well the divine appoints us whatever action he has appointed me to hey keshav whatever action you appoint me to do that i should do and that action may be big in the eyes of people small in the eyes of people so that i should do so again the attachment to action or inaction goes away and obviously if the divine is the the psychic being uh, is surrendered so automatically it, it teaches us surrender so we receive whatever comes from the divine the gita puts it in a different way beautiful way i love the way gita puts it that you take over the leftover of the yagya so life becomes a yagya and whatever is given to us we receive it with uh, humility and gratitude and if nothing comes in our share that to be remain full of gratitude to the divine so this is how this practice helps us to deepen into the psychic experience and i think this practice is a base should be there with all and i just uh, 
wanted to complete that ah okay okay the essay on the gita and isha upanishad commented yes in these things shri arbito has clearly explained the elucidated the karma yoga and the principles of karma yoga yes are, are there factors with which he has enlarged the scope of the traditional karma yoga according to you okay excellent in, in his in, in the integral yoga yes very much so the uh, the karma yoga is enunciated in the gita this is a very beautiful and very relevant question leads towards liberation in action and through action so liberation in action means that well while one is ac- uh, engaged in work still one is inwardly free it leads us to that avastha of jivan mukta and it liberates to leads to liberation through action that means we don't have to withdraw from action into you know some forest or hermitage to um, to to discover this inner liberation so uh, this is where the gita yoga of the gita its karma yoga ends but here karma is not only a means to liberation but a means to manifest the divine so now here comes the second type part of the karma yoga which or or sure bindos karma yoga or karma yoga the upgraded karma yoga as we see in sure bindos yoga here the instruments have to develop and instruments have to be transformed because for example i may be inwardly free from all attachment as a doctor when i am seeing patients or as a speaker when i am speaking i may be free of all attachment to the fruits i may be free of the sense of doership i may even experience that is the divine mother who is speaking or or seeing the patient as well as i may be free from this attachment that i have to speak or not speak or i have to see a patient or i don't have to see a patient so this is the yoga of the gita but is medicine which i am practicing is the highest expression of the divine manifestation of the divine healing energies how does the divine heal how would the divine speak how would the divine write that means now my instruments have to be so open such a channel which means a great degree of perfection and purification of the channels the sensory channels the natural instrument the mind thought Uh, that's why rejection comes in as a very important element and also open to the mother because the mother's force alone can transform the instrument so this is uh, the add on uh, the yoga of the gita is a stepping board and then shurb as to karma yoga and then shurb in those karma yoga if i may use the word shubhendra did not say it's my karma yoga but the yoga of transformation in that the karma yoga is upgraded to the next level which is transformation of the instrument and making them perfect channels for the divine to manifest because the goal of shubhendra yoga is divine manifestation gita hints at it but gita does not explicitly place it as the goal it hints at it it says uses the word lok sangrahar to carry the march of humanity but ultimately it ends with that liberation aham tva sarva papibhyo mokshishami masucha but manifestation is shurbindo's unique contribution so thank you and pranam 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 so i think we have covered the second question also what is original absolute is this different from the already known concepts of brahman such a nirakar and nirgun brahman already that has been covered third in shurbindo's philosophy the universe continues to exist even after jeeva's transformation beside objects such as sun moon earth and the material universe do not disappear if this is the case will there be no transformation of the material universe does it remain material and inert no it never is inert this bhed is our bhed bhav <laughs> we treat the objects as inert objects if they could say they would not like it we kick the door as if it is inert it never is inert so when the consciousness awaken we discover it is not inert to start with and when we discover it is not inert it starts responding to us when mother would pluck the vegetables how did she do it she didn't go examine whether they are ripe or not she would just hear the vegetables tell her come 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 i am ready and she would go and pluck them flowers would speak to her stones would speak the bath tub water would speak not the bath tub the water running from the tap would speak so the entire material universe has the divine concealed within it and for the divine to bring out that divine we must undergo the change and just as the mental man has recreated this world material universe he has recreated who knew that in this jad jagat there is the possibility of silicon valley valley <laughs> in silica so mental man has discovered it 
So the supramental being will discover many more wonders. It doesn't have to say, okay, let me find out what is the computer paradigm. It may pick up a piece of clay and breathe life of the spirit within it. It's, it may sound preposterous, but they hints when Ram picks up a blade of grass and throws it at Jayanth, it changes into a Brahmastra. So, the dealing with matter will change drastically and what that can be, we can't even imagine. Because concealed in each atom of existence is the absolute presence. Which means healing. The way we do it today, now again it is hinted in our scripture, very interesting. When uh, Angad is hurt very badly and this applies to, no, sorry, Null is hurt very badly. Even with Angad it goes and it's said about the Vanara in general. So what does Sri Ram do? He takes them in his lap and he puts his hand. And as the story goes, they feel strengthened and healed. So they think he's doing magic. He explains, he explains that your state of consciousness, he doesn't use technical word. But he says that, well, if you do it with goodwill, with that love, it has a healing touch. So imagine a supramental being will not heal by prescribing medicines. Maybe he'll just look. And you may feel he's looking blank. And you may feel healed. Cool. Then we'll call him, he's a cool dude. <laughs> in the real sense of the word. So, we in everything, with speaking, he doesn't need to prepare, oh my question, it's like when he, performance or an exam. <laughs> no. She will use this speech, if this, but we have to then practice much more deeper. For instance, we cannot allow our um, apparatus of speech to be misused. Because we have to keep this apparatus uh, nice. We can't allow our hands to be misused. Let loose on anyone. So everything will become conscious. Walk should become conscious. So this is how the whole thing will change. Just in brief I am answering them. Okay. So it never is inert. It will begin to manifest and reveal many more secrets that is now not revealed. Sanjeev Nibuti is revealed by the Himalayas. Now we have lost it. It doesn't want to reveal. Because we'll use that Sanjeevni booty to revive all the, you know, <laughs> soldiers in Middle East and everywhere. So Himalaya has hidden it. And now we keep saying, this is Sanjeevni booty, this is Sanjeevni booty. Pinak, bow of Shiva, it is conscious. It won't allow anybody to pick up. But Mata Sita at the age of five can pick it up. And so can Lord Ram, whereas Ravan cannot. So instrument will become conscious. Sudarshan Chakra is a material instrument, but it's conscious. So, this is how we'll have those changes. Fourth uh, or fifth here. Um, okay, fourth. If we accept the premise that once the individual souls emanate from the Brahman, then the creation begins. No, creation begins before that. In the supramental, yes, the individual soul, one becomes the many, but there is the eternal manifestation of the loks. Of course, the supermind differentiates these loks. So, in a way, we can say, but let me put that question fully. Then the creation begins and the individual soul, Jivatma, do not attain their union with the Brahman. In this case, we must accept that the creation began at some point. By implication, this means there was no Srishti prior to this creation. Then how can the Srishti be called Sanatan? Very simple. When I write, uh, let's say, Vyas writes Mahabharat. So when Vyas, or I'll take the example of Valmiki. When Valmiki writes Ramayana, so you can say this is the birth of Ramayana. So you say, take Ramayana as the Srishti. So you say that, well, Ramayana is born at this point of time. And till now, the glory of Ramayana continues. So we can say it has a beginning and who knows if there is an end or not. But did Ramayana begin there? No. If you ask Valmiki, he says, no, 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 no. It began when I saw an incidence. Two crunch pakshi. They were mating and they were killed by a vyada. So you know, I, my heart was deeply moved. By the tragedy of love and that gave birth to Ramayana. <laughs> then you ask, is that the origin? No, 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 no. In my heart, Ramayana was brewing up. It had not manifested. So this is the unmanifest state of creation. If you say, okay, this is the origin. No, 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 no. Its origin is still further. What is the origin? You will say, somebody told me, Ram, 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 I could not say Ram, I said Mara, Mara and Ulta, Nam, Japa, Jag, Jana, Balmi, Kibai, Brahma, Samana. So I was given the glory of Ram. 
So Ramayana is the much later outcome. The name which is the foundation of eternity. Is the name of the divine perishable? No, it's not perishable. This creation is always held within the Lord, the Absolute. It is not separate from the Lord. If it is separate from the Lord, it is like brought out and Lord says, Okay, I have nothing to do with it. I am not the owner. I am not the creator. Then yes, it has a beginning and end. But in Hindu Dharma, it is not seen like that. It originates in the Hiranyagarbh Avastha. And Hiranyagarbh, before that, it is held back in the Pragya. In the completely non-manifest state. There also, the seed is there. It is not released. So the seed, if you see of creation, it is there in the Supreme. But it comes down layer by layer. When it manifests in time, it is called as temporal manifestation. Martlok. In Martlok, you have a beginning and end. Yes. So we can talk about beginning and we also talk about pralaya. Obviously, it has ended. So there is a beginning. It's the same thing with our souls. When we are born and die, do our souls die? No. Yet we say of the person that he was born and he died. But if you go back to the soul, yes, it is with the divine in the supramental status before time and space has become. So temporal manifestation when time and space have come into existence. But things exist before time and space enter into existence. And I'll give just one example as an exercise, a practice and we'll leave this question there. We say I, just one day, five minutes, contemplate on this I. What is this I? Who is I? You will see spontaneously space and time will vanish. You can't think of both at the same time. The moment you think of locating this I in space or locating in terms of time, you will lose the thread of I. <laughs> That's why it's a very powerful practice. A very simple practice, not something complicated. Just five minutes contemplating the I. And you'll see that space and time collapse. But I remains. The self-awareness, that existence remains. So many practices, but I'm just leaving with one. Fifth question. In philosophy, knowing the highest state a soul can attain is essential. In Shurabindo's philosophy, what is a soul's highest state can attain? According to this philosophy, can the individual souls exceed the state of devatas very much? We came from the domain before the devatas. Supramental. That's before the gods have come into existence. Gods come into existence later on. So when we go to, you know, Sri that's why it is known that it's called as a fall. So why fall? Because we are, if we want to put it, we are one of the gods. And we carry within this soul the entire supreme divine. Whereas gods cannot evolve. Each devata is only one aspect of the divine. So in every which way we look, man is a god, but he has forgotten himself. Therefore, he is being given Dobi Pashad Yoga by the divine. He is picking us, putting us with the rocks and we say, ah, why are you doing it? But he is cleansing us so that we realize that we are, each one is a god and not only a god, we are one with the supreme. That's the great word of all the scriptures, not only Shirobindo. So must me. I am that. I am not just a Devi or Devata. But Devi and Devtas are all reside within me. And they are powers which can emerge and help the human soul. And they have cosmic dimension. But man is a god. And, uh, and it is known that there are human beings who even became god. Not necessarily the supreme reality. Narad is one such example of a demigod. Born a human. But he realizes status of eternal status of being with the divine. As Vishnu. So there is this example. Uh, Second is, can they attain, for instance, the state of the Brahma with four faces? Uh, this four faces is our own idea of Brahma. Four faces are the space because he, his existence spreading out in space. So we should not start literally taking this. Of course, if our mind believes it's four faces, then when, and particularly we have seen the ZTV serials and all, so we will end up seeing Brahma with four faces. Poor Brahma will have no choice. Because we will not recognize him. <laughs> if he comes with one face, we will ask him, where are your three faces? By the way, in the original story, Brahma had five faces. <laughs> so, but that is a different thing. I will not go into it. So, yes, one with Brahma, even in the ashram, there is an instance. There was a time when the gods had started descending into uh, these sadhaks. And that is where the mother had realized that Devasrishti, 
not divis rishti over mind creation and brahma's consciousness had descended into amrit we call as amrita varuna's into uh, nalnida so these gods consciousnesses can even be have this in the mahabharat indra's consciousness taking charge of arjun is not he is a child means what he extends santan means extend santan literally means my consciousness extends into this being so indra being the father of arjun means indra's consciousness extends into him and even those powers for example ashwini kumars they had healing powers so every time uh, soldiers were sick the great ones you know they otherwise they were normal um, um, doctors uh, vaid but when there was a serious injury let's say to one of the um, if pandavas had to be injured or some some of these chieftains then it was to uh, to nakul sahdev why because they were extensions of ashwin kumars so even some powers of ashwin kumar had extended into them nal neel again because they were ashwin kumar so some of them had these healing proper energies because they were extensions of the god so this is a well known thing and we can go much even before beyond brahma uh, in the sense that man is a part creator anyways so we must uh, not uh, underestimate ourselves but of course if we start believing egoistically i am brahma then we are ready for the uh, lunatic asylum so <laughs> that's why <laughs> these are profound things when shurabinda says that the yoga is done by god strength what does it mean it is the truth of our life yesterday we had a whole discussion on it on personal effort and grace whose strength is there in this creation logically can there be two sources of power one human one divine one for the god there has to be one power that power becomes in the gods devatma shakti divine mother that power that power becomes in human beings and the jar jagat power of nature prakriti which is the doer now instead of being governed by prakriti if you open to the divine mother actually in any case she is doing but she is doing hidden behind the veil of prakriti isn't prakriti the doer every action that we do day and night our listening at this point and speaking at this point is prakriti and what is the power that informs prakriti is aditi the divine mother prakriti she gives limited amount okay what's your quota she would say mother i need only that much because human beings only want to eat drink and be merry uh, little bit work they do little bit religion so she gives okay take this much limited amount suddenly prakriti will go and say divine mother there is one sadhak aspirant he wants to become your instrument what do i do she say okay i'll take charge <laughs> so it is shakti who else will do the yoga but what is our role then our role is to open to the shakti our role is to make sure that when the shakti flows we don't clog her block her obstruct her working through resistance like doubts and depression and you know despair and discouragement and all these things we have to allow the shakti to work so you could be arjun if he has to become instrument he cannot be full of doubts that's why keshav make sure that all his doubts are annihilated before the war begins because he has to become an instrument so work will be done by the shakti we have a role in it to allow her to work is itself not easy every time the ego desire ambition will interfere and we have to tell them keep quiet or go away you have no place in this house of the lord fear will come tell fear run my survey because this is the house dedicated to the divine mother okay when sh- okay when it is said that the mother's force must work through sadhak what does this mean same thing i think i have just answered it taking both into account buddha was termed greatest karma yogi by swami vekananda but buddha himself did not speak of god could there be any sadhana of karma yoga without any reference to god first of all swami vekananda had a great affinity to buddha so we should not take every word spoken like he spoke at one time very highly of the american <laughs> went hyperbole then he you know took it very differently so we should not take everything he is a great but i would not say that greatest of the great he is great and he did profound things but uh, we should not take that as the ultimate um, aptavakya praman 
Buddha is great, again great, without, without a doubt. And Buddha's karma yoga in that sense is great that he uh, sitting silently is the image of somebody who doesn't uh, speak much, doesn't preach much and yet his action has spread over the world. So in that sense he is karma yogi. Buddha didn't believe in God of religions. But Buddha talked about the permanent. Buddha talked about compassion. How can there be compassion in a godless state? He spoke about the permanent towards which human beings should strive. He didn't like to use the word God or metaphysical speculation because he was tired of all these things. During his time, all the people were discussing again Vedanta, Dvaita, Advaita and all these things. Buddha realized all this is leading towards Karm Kand and all kinds of debate discussion. His interest was not that. His interest was not metaphysical speculation. His interest was a practical way out of suffering. And for that, mastery over desire and ego was important. And as I said, even in Karm Yoga, if one can practice still the stage of equality, one is liberated. Samatvam Yoga Uchyate. Do we need to believe in God for that? No, we don't need to believe in God. Even a Jnan Yogi does not need to believe in God that way. He believes in self with a capital cell, S. So he speaks about Atman. Buddha speaks about the permanent, which people interpreted as, he used the word Anatma also. But similarly, just as we say Niti Neti, or we say Iti Iti. So he didn't use the word God. The God in the religious sense Ishwara that came later on. So it's perfectly fine, one can do. As long as one believes in progress and perfection and the permanent beyond the temporary, it's fine. So we need not use. Jainism also doesn't speak about God. Anatmavad, Nastik, even Sankhya doesn't speak about God. It's also regarded as a Nastik approach. But it, it talks about Purusha. So one must believe that there is a beyond, a greater possibility, a higher possibility. And one must progress toward that perfect state or that permanence. Because um, God allows him. Uh, finally, is there any relation between karma yoga and the present moment awareness? This is school nowadays, present moment awareness. And I have a lot to speak about it, but in very short. See, this is one of the uh, things which is a practice, part of mindful meditation, which is uh, neo-Buddhism, it is drawn from there. So it is a very good remedy for anxieties, I would say. Because you don't go into the past, don't go towards the future. But if you make it a whole yoga and ultimate remedy, I'm sorry, it's, uh, it's um, fanning too much around a spark. It's good to be aware of the present moment. But which present moment? I get angry and I want to slap somebody. I am aware of this present moment when the impulse of anger is within me and I want to kick somebody. Should I kick? <laughs> That's the question. So when we talk about the present moment, we must qualify it as the present eternal moment, which is very difficult to get in touch with. Or the present divine moment if we want to do it. Or the present highest within me. Each moment... I am called upon to make choices. I can't be sitting saying I am living in the present moment. When I eat, will I mechanically eat? It's a practice, I know that. Will I make a choice or not? What is making the choice? There is something between that moment, awareness and the action. So this awareness of the present moment often becomes otherworldly because that for Buddhist practice is perfectly fine because it disconnects awareness with the will to act. But, as Sri tells us, knowledge and will are one in the supermind. And we should not dissociate them. In our mental consciousness, they are dissociated. But in the highest consciousness, they are together. So we must strive for that eternal present, if you want to put it like that, in which there is no dissociation. Knowledge, awareness is right awareness and action is the right action. This is what Buddha taught. He spoke about the Eightfold Path, right understanding, right perception, right action. It should become spontaneous. But simply being aware of the breath or something, it calms the mind. And if calming the mind is the goal, it's fine. But if the goal is to realize the divine, it's nothing. It's a good remedy for anxiety.
but not a cure or a permanent prevention for it. Okay, we'll close because we have gone far beyond the time. Jai Maa.